nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Good afternoon, everyone. Hope you had a good break. Um, I like to play that video because I think it represents uh, a lot of the innovation and change that's happening in the world at the moment, a lot of the renewed aspiration to create uh, truly life-changing technologies and truly life-changing dreams. I think the last 20 years or 30 years, other than the uh, internet, um, perhaps we haven't been dreaming as big as we, we can, and I think with space travel, uh, the resurgence of the space industry, um, there are a myriad of transformative innovations that are taking place as we speak that will totally change uh, our world in the coming 20 years. Um, that, that particular aircraft, as you probably know, is no longer with us. It, uh, it suffered failure last year and fell apart. Uh, we lost one of the test pilots and the program had a dramatic setback, but is back on schedule and you know, is testament to the tenacity and vision of one man and his dreams. Um, we are constantly updated with the progress of the subsequent crafts and uh, you know, still very much looking forward to making Richard's dream a reality. There's about 700 of us in the community from all around the world that have signed up to do this and we meet regularly and uh, learn what the challenges are and learn about all the people that are, that are working on this project. In the next 20 years, I think you've already been uh, introduced this today, not introduced, but um, reviewed a lot of the technologies that are coming forward, including things like 3D printing, nanotechnology, satellite prolif proliferation, virtual and augmented reality, and the blockchain. Um, a whole raft of innovations that promise to reach the next four billion around the world and to positively transform society, to alleviate some of the greatest challenges we face and to heal and treat the planet better than we have. As I've sought to understand these, to understand a wider horizon, I have at this point concluded that all of these evolutions are really underpinning a second coming of the internet. Uh, that is perhaps the more rightful heir of the moniker uh, Internet 2.0, as opposed to Web 2.0. Earlier in the year, I went camping up to Cape Ranga and watched the Tasman and Pacific Oceans meet. And there are two proud seas swirling and clashing and challenging each other for supremacy and to be heard. Uh, I think we are making our very early steps into a new era that today looks much like this picture where when we look back, we might see that the old ways of how we interpret the internet and digital technology will look incomplete and forced and disparate. Uh, we are making very early steps into a new era that today I think uh, we'll find ourselves imagining uh, that the devices that we're using today are trapped in the way that they're containing the way we access the internet and connect to it. The siloing of where and how you access technology, data, and content from where and how you exist in your surroundings, I think, will no longer be marked as two separate domains. As signs are slowly but surely appearing that technology and information 
is stubbornly weaving itself into the very fabric of our lives and the built environment that we live them in. The question, I believe, is starting to move from how and where you access the internet to when and why the internet will start accessing you. I'll attempt to speak briefly about two elements of what I feel is taking place before moving to have a conversation with Andrew on what the implications might be. The first is a move from information to data and insights. The internet is very much about information. It's a sea of information and transactions. It's a one-way oracle where you need to pull everything of value towards you. Mobile has created an extension of this body of the internet and has definitely enabled an element of push. But I think if we look back on it in 10 years from now, we will see that it is a very rudimentary interpretation of that. Take, for example, Google or searching. If we bring that idea to its first principles, which is to help you find the answers and things that you want versus searching or browsing for options of what you might want, Google is very well suited to the latter, but not as much to the former. To clarify, Google often doesn't answer your questions, and it doesn't retrieve the exact things that you ask for. So as a form of an oracle, it's amazing, but it is still relatively, I think, in the context, quite stupid. There are relatively few number of queries that it actually answers very, very well. For example, convert US dollars 100 into baht, or 100 plus 50, or what's the weather in Auckland? Basic functions of a calculator. It's still quite contextually deaf, and therefore can be dumb in its replies. Those of us who think we are good at navigating Google, like me, have learned to construct very strange ways of inserting the search query to mirror the sentence structure of the answer that we want, similar to the game Jeopardy. Instead of actually asking the actual question or entering the actual command we want, because we know that the, asking the question won't necessarily get the answer from Google. So the internet and the way we experience it, as amazing it is, as it is, is still not full or rich yet with insights or personalizations. And I think when we look back, that will look like a very basic version of what we're beginning to experience in 10 or 20 years. So how might this change? It might change with greater artificial intelligence, algorithms, and personalization. But most likely, it will change by a new company starting up in a garage somewhere that starts over from scratch and imagines the way we navigate and search our world in a totally different way to create the new Google. The new interface to navigate the web as we know it and, about, and what it's about to come, to become. Perhaps the more important question is what is the web as we know it and where is it going? As we move from web pages and apps to anything that is connected to the internet. In the 20 plus years since it was invented, the major transformation of the web is perhaps its extension to mobile devices. The fundamental idea of which was what was the basis for the first company I built, the Hyperfactory. We used to call this future ahead of us ubiquitous computing or ubiquity. But reality is that we might look back on this and find that's quite silly because really it's not ubiquitous at all. Lots of us having a computing device or the internet in our pocket, but human beings are hardly the sum total of ubiquity. There is a whole world out there of objects, spaces, and natural and man-made architecture that make up humanity. So back to the internet. We have had significant increases in speed, graphics, storage, that has enabled myriad of digital services to be born. But essentially, what we are watching, if we are watching a movie of someone access the internet today in 2015, is very little different from us watching Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan access the internet in You've Got Mail in 1998. Essentially, it's the same thing. You sit down, turn on a computer or a laptop or a device, it connects, and there is now what we have as a browser. You type an address and you navigate using the mouse, keyboard, and browse through various pages. You read, watch, send messages, or various interactions with people or machines. And the more connected every user is, and the higher the speeds, the more we can do. That's pretty much about it. But what happens now when the internet moves beyond? Beyond first the desktop-sized gray boxes, and then the desktop-sized white boxes, to the portfolio-sized cases, to small black glass bars, 
to slim book-like slabs and now to wrist-sized ingots. What happens when the internet moves beyond being accessed essentially via terminal that you have to pull from to being in everything around us that makes up our world? In our furniture, in our clothes, and in our cars, in our pets, and in our bathrooms, and in our bodies, and on our roads, in our concrete, and in our street signs. What happens when, as is bound to happen in the coming decade, the internet is truly everywhere, like an invisible lifeblood, creating a network infinitely more complex and with infinitely more nodes than the current internet we have come to know and love today? What are the next frontiers, and where will they take us? We are, I guess, at the very early stages of what will become a decades-long transition but some examples may start to come to light around two major premises that will be the building blocks of the evolution of the internet to become truly ubiquitous. First, sensors. Sensors which will unload on the world by the billions and billions in the coming decade. When, not if, sensors capable of detecting themselves, their environment, and communicating with other sensors, the internet and you, will become as cheap as scrap paper and as small as stickers. When that happens, how does this change the responsibilities of the chief information officer or the chief data officer? When the internet starts appearing and connecting from everywhere, perhaps it will be renamed from the internet of things to something more like an outernet. We can imagine all manner of ordinary devices being connected to understand their environments and monitor activity and key data. Let's say, for example, razors and toothbrushes that become everyday health device monitors. We can imagine perhaps devices being implanted under our skin that monitor vital metrics through our bloodstream via nanotechnology to give us more accurate personal health meters. We can imagine every workstation, every vehicle in a corporate fleet, every swipe card and every corporate asset all somehow being connected to each other and the internet. We can imagine perhaps that what we think of as the chaos brought into the corporate IT infrastructure and departments by the bring your own devices movement was really only a practice run for what might occur with such an alternate. Secondly, combined with the proliferation of sensors will be the long awaited redefinition of what a screen or an interface is. From hard to soft or foldable and from flat to curved and from real to virtual. These have all been elements of science fiction over the last few decades, but they are now becoming very much around the corner. Google very recently launched the project Jacquard, which is a toolkit for creating smart fabrics that can connect to sensors and thereby the internet. The way this can be done is that within the threads that make up the fabric, conducting threads are woven and these threads are coated in special coatings that sense, touch and transmit data. The data then can be accessed and sent to other devices. If smart sensors and chips are built in, creativity is the only limit to what is possible in the infrastructure and the built environment that we live in. The idea of being able to build in switches, controls, or sensors within fabric or construction materials themselves is a new form of experience, experiencing information both within an organization and outside of it. This is, of course, just one tiny example of a toolkit for a new conception of what the interface to the internet might be, of which thousands and thousands will soon start appearing over the coming years. We have to date been asked to, one, interact with the internet through terminals, terminals that we pull up and that we turn on, log in, and access. And we have to date been asked to Two, communicate with such terminals through purpose-built screens and keyboards on our phones, laptops, and other devices. As these two legacy behaviors begin to evolve such that the internet starts to appear everywhere and starts to access us, one of the key questions facing anybody in charge of information and data is why does it matter and what can we do about it?